Welcome back to The Urban Monk. Dr. Pedram Shojai here today. I want to talk about gardening. As you may or may not know, um, I tore out the lawn at my house and put in raised beds and I've been gardening for the last couple of years. And I love it. My kids are out there all the time. We just, uh, we just had a, a couple solid gardening days and <clears throat> it's near and dear to my heart. And it's something that I've constantly been kind of uh, emphasizing with my friends and family and people are just, you know, people are in my world are starting to get into it just because my kids are so into it and it's a, and it's a big deal. So uh, we called in uh, an expert uh, and uh, the expert is from the Ni National Wildlife Federation. So this is a big deal. David Mizajewski is communications director. He does all the media over there. And they have an initiative uh, called Garden for Wildlife. And um, to me, it's fascinating. I love this work and uh, I want to just jump in. So David, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Hey, great. So uh, let's let's start with the National Wildlife uh, Federation because I don't know if everyone knows what NWF is. Like, what what is it? What's your mission? Yeah. So we're one of the oldest and largest wildlife conservation organizations here in the U.S. We focus on North America, and our mission is to inspire Americans to unite and make sure that wildlife thrives in a rapidly changing world. And it's really no no secret that the cause of that rapid change is pretty much human activity. Um, you know, and so unfortunately, as we develop things and we pollute and we destroy habitat, wildlife is negatively impacted. So that's what we do. And, and, and again, we focus on North America. So we're doing everything from, you know, working here in Washington, D.C., where I live, to make sure that we have strong wildlife protection laws. Um, we're working on the ground in regional offices and through a network of state affiliates that really give us a grassroots component. Um, we are also doing a lot of work to help get kids connected to nature. And I'm really thrilled to hear that you're getting your kids out in the garden because that's that's what a big part of the work that we do at National Wildlife Federation is all about. You might have heard of Ranger Rick. He is our ambassador. Um, we've got a magazine called Ranger Rick that we've been publishing for 50 years. I read it as a kid growing up, and it really did help inspire me to want to go on and be a naturalist and you know learn about the natural world and want to protect it. So we do a lot of different things at the National Wildlife Federation, but at the core, it's all about making sure we have a future where wildlife can thrive. So we're in a, <clears throat> a climate that's a little hostile to it now. I mean, it's either you're pro-business or you're pro-nature. You can't be somewhere in between because obviously, you know, the world black and white somehow. Right. Um, so what's the, current, what's the current overview of like what our challenges are, especially in North America, with wildlife? Oh, gosh, that's a huge question. I mean, I, I, think, <coughs> I think you hit the nail on the head, though, by calling out this, um, what I would say is a false black and white nature that that conservation issues and environmental issues often fall into here's the reality conservation is not a partisan issue we all need clean air we all need clean water you know most of us love the fact that there's wildlife out in the world we're inspired by it and we love to see it and the national wildlife federation really does try to embody that we you know you, you hear the term big tent thrown around a lot the national wildlife federation truly is a big tent organization i mean we were founded back in 1936 in part because um, you know we were seeing wildlife species decline and hunters and anglers were, were one of our initial constituents and they continue to be to this day. Um, at the same time, we've got folks that are you know are, are, are animal lovers and they really want to get out there and protect wildlife and you know wildlife gardeners and birders and hikers and campers. So our role at the National Wildlife Federation in our eyes is to be that unifying voice because no matter what your political you know, affiliation or, or views are, you know, again, we all need clean, a clean environment and we all love wildlife. And so our role at National Wildlife Federation is to bring people together from across the political spectrum and say, hey, listen, this is important and we really got to work together to make sure that we have a future where wildlife is part of it. Amazing. You know, we, we had a, a guest uh, not too long ago, uh, Nature's Allies, um, something like that, where, you know, I, I never even heard this before. I consider myself an environmentalist. And he's like, well, there's conservationists and environmentalists, right? Like, well, well, what's the difference, right? Because yeah. uh, a lot of the conservation efforts that have happened uh, in North America that I have now come to understand are from hunters. Uh, because, you know, if you suddenly you're out there trying to find deer and there's no more deer, that's a problem. And right. so, and, and a lot of, you know, a lot of people I know in that space are very, very, serious about you know the tags absolutely. and the policies and all that absolutely yeah now I'm personally not a hunter right that's not something that I personally would enjoy doing but I absolutely recognize that hunters and anglers in many ways were the first conservationists and I think we have this impression that's probably outdated of this sort of you know 
ravenous madmen out there, you know, killing and shooting every animal out there. But the fact of the matter is today that hunting is, is, is managed by professional wildlife biologists. It's done, um, it's regulated and, and, you know, it's done in a way that is science-based so that we can, again, manage wildlife populations and make sure that they're sustainable. And at the same time, um, it's also a reality that the licenses for hunting and fishing go back right into most states' conservation programs. So that's how we fund conservation. And so um, certainly, yeah, I'm sure you have bad apples out there who, you know, who are out just sort of, you know, to, you know, destroy the earth and are only out there shooting because it makes them feel like a big manly man or whatever. But I think generally speaking, most concert, most hunters and anglers are really truly conservationists. And again, they're a big part of who the National Wildlife Federation is, in addition to, you know, people that just love wildlife and care about it. Amazing. So... You know, it's funny, this came up with the uh, the dentist who shot the lion, and then it became this whole thing about, like, you know, the, the hunting that happens in Africa. And a part of the story that broke out for me, which was, you know, unknown at the time, was, well, it's those hunting expeditions that fund a lot of the conservation in Africa, and it kind of, you know, illustrated some of the things that were happening here on the home front. Um, again, I didn't, know any, I didn't know any of that. So what species in particular, like, where, what areas do we need the help the most right now in where we're at? Well, you know, it would be really nice if I could say, <laughs> if that was an easy answer and I could just give you one or two species. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is that there are many species that are in big trouble. Um, you know, I mean, everything from, uh, we've got a great campaign going on right now in California, in the Los Angeles area called Save LA Cougars. And I think I love that name because it's an example of how even conservationists can have a sense of humor. No, we're not talking about <laughs> you know, middle-aged ladies that like to date younger men. We're talking about the mountain lion or cougar population that lives in the Santa Monica Mountains. And while mountain lions as a species are, are doing okay, that particular population is at risk of going extinct. And it's because of all of the development um, and the urban sprawl of that area. And what happens is that these animals have to cross roads like the busy 101 and the 405 highways, and, um, and they get run over. And so the, we've got sort of the poster cougar, his name is P-22, and he's actually living in Griffith Park right in Los Angeles. And he had to cross those, those freeways to get there. Um, and so the idea that we're trying to promote is building a highway overpass that would allow wildlife to get from point A to point B to find food and find mates, not just the, the cougars, all wildlife in that area. And this is a, a model that has been used really successfully in Europe and other parts of the world. And so that's one example of a campaign um, for a group of animals that are in real trouble. We're also working at the National Wildlife Federation to get bison reintroduced to their native habitat on America's Great Plains. Um, bison, many people know, we almost wiped them out a few hundred years ago by again, over hunting, unregulated hunting. And um, and so the, the, the bison, we were able to save them and they're nowhere near their historic numbers, but most people might not know that the bison that exists today largely exists on private property. And um, there's only a few places where there are true free ranging wild bison on public lands. And so the National Wildlife Federation for the last several years has been um, working to get bison back onto our public lands. We've actually successfully worked with several different um, Indian tribes, American Indian tribes, to get bison reintroduced onto their land as well. So really exciting. We've got a great program called Adopt a Wildlife Acre, where what we do is we um, we work with the ranching community where there are conflicts with bison and other wildlife, and we basically buy out their grazing rights to certain pieces of of contested land. So the rancher benefits because then he can go, you know, buy another allotment elsewhere where there's not wildlife conflict and we're able to turn that land back over to the wildlife. So it's a really great win-win kind of program. Um, I, we're working down in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we've had a real strong presence down in that area for many years, mostly focusing on restoring the Mississippi Delta that flows into the Gulf of Mexico. And of course, when the BP oil disaster happened, we were there on the ground. And um, one of the roles that we played at the National Wildlife Federation was to tell the story. Um, if you recall, there was a little bit of a, a sense of media suppression going on. And so what we did as National, National Wildlife Federation that we chartered boats and we took reporters out and showed them the damage. And so we're still actively working down there to make sure that the, the fines that BP has to pay are actually going to restore wildlife habitat. Um, so just, just a, a sampling of some of the things we do. And of course, I mentioned all of our work with kids 
and Nature, um, Ranger Rick Magazine. We've actually got three Ranger Rick Magazines. Ranger Rick Cub is our newest one for the little itty bitty guys that you read to, you know, you read it to them. We've got Ranger Rick Jr., which is four to seven, and then classic Ranger Rick Magazine, which is um, seven to 12. So the National Wildlife Federation does a whole bunch of work and it's all focused on protecting wildlife and getting people reconnected to nature so that we can appreciate and love the wildlife so that we want to protect it. I love this idea of setting up wildlife corridors here in North America. I know one of the big success stories in, in Africa, um, in the Kruger Park and some of these is, you know, just opening up national borders to allow these elephants and mig migratory species to move. And it's, it's been a very successful program. Uh, so, yeah. you know, whether it's a bridge or whatever, just getting wildlife right. to actually cruise well, around. Yeah, and that's actually another thing that I should mention. Um, uh, monarch butterflies have, again, declined by uh, almost 90% in just the last 20 years. And the reason for that is because we've removed the only plant that their caterpillars can eat, and it's milk. the plant is called milkweed. Um, there's a bunch of different species of milkweed that are native to North America, but it's, a, it's, a, it's complicated, probably too much to get into here, but be, you know, milkweed has a PR problem because it's got weed in the name, mm -hmm. and so you know, we historically have viewed it as a weed and we tried to get rid of it in our suburban and urban landscapes and agricultural lands, you know, it's kind of viewed as a pest and so they try to herbicide it. And, um, and, and, and so we've gotten really good at getting rid of the milkweed. It has, you know, the, the agriculture community using GMO crops that are herbicide resistant are now able to spray more herbicides therefore killing more milkweed. And again, the home gardener is so obsessed with their lawn that they do the same thing. And as a result, the milkweed has gone away on the monarch's breeding habitat, which is all of um, you know the U.S. up into southern Canada, and the population has plummeted. So, what the National Wildlife Federation is doing is working with a coalition of uh, of other conservation groups, government agencies, to really try to focus on the migratory corridor of the monarch butterfly. They spend the eastern population, everything east of the Rockies, they fly down to Mexico and spend the winter, and then they have to fly back up, and over the course of several generations repopulate all of the US and Southern Canada. It's pretty amazing. And in order to do that, they need milkweed in the central flyway from Texas up to Minnesota, which happens to be where a big, a big chunk of our agriculture um, is in this country. So what we're, we're trying to do is create a migratory flyway with lots of milkweed and with lots of nectar plants for the adults as well so that we can really bolster the monarch population. And um, we were working with mayors. We've got something called the Mayor's Monarch Pledge where mayors and other community leaders are pledging to do a series of things um, at our recommendation to make their communities better for wildlife. We've got a campaign going on right now called Butterfly Heroes which is a fun campaign designed to get kids involved in, in planting butterfly gardens. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of work in, along that idea of creating this sort of corridor for the monarchs. And of course, like I mentioned earlier, when you create a habitat and protect a habitat for, you know, one species, typically you're also benefiting dozens if not hundreds of others. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that, the wildlife habitat garden, because I've, you know, we, we had, you know, we got this house and we, you know, we had a lawn and Southern California doesn't have water. We have no business watering a lawn. So we tore it out. We put in six raised beds. My kids are out there all the time. It's delightful. I mean, I literally, I spent the last, uh, you know, all day Sunday and a few hours yesterday evening out there. And uh, it was great. Uh, there are all kinds of bugs. There's all kinds of roly polies and caterpillars and all, and my kids get to know these. It is a habitat. So yeah. how, how does this program work? How does one set up a garden, garden habitat and avoid using yeah. all the, 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 the chemicals and the crap to kill off the pests? Right. Well, that's, that's a big part of it. So, so you, you already have experienced it. So, and that's really what this program is all about. It's just trying to inspire people to get outside and just do some simple things. And everybody can do this. It doesn't matter if you, you know, have 10 acres of land or if you live in the city and all you have is a little, you know, balcony where you could do a couple of containers. If you can plant something, you can make a wildlife habitat. And, and I think, you know, taking a step back, I always like to begin by trying to connect the dots between why a wildlife conservation group has a garden program, because most gardeners are taught you don't want wildlife around, right? Mm -hmm. And the first thing you should do is spray everything and keep the animals out. Here's why. It's because plants are the foundation of wildlife habitat in any ecosystem. They're the bottom of the food chain. And so without plants, and specifically native plants, the plants that naturally evolved in your region, without those native plant communities, there will be no wildlife. That's just a, you know, a, you know, an ecological scientific fact. And so 
Um, because of that, that's why we, we have spun this as a garden program, because ultimately what the Garden for Wildlife program is, 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 is trying to do is inspire people to plant more native plants in their yards and whatever other garden spaces throughout their community. And in doing so, they're going to begin to support and, and kind of reconnect what I call the human dominated landscape. So our cities, our towns, our neighborhoods, where we can reconnect those back into the bigger ecosystem mm. versus what we have done, what we have tended to do over the last hundred years, which is banish the wildlife out by removing all the native plants and only planting non-native things that don't support wildlife and spraying pesticides and herbicides everywhere. And so it's it's just about um, living a little bit more gently on the land, about sharing our space with appropriate wildlife. Again, we're talking birds and butterflies and bees and you know maybe frogs and toads. We're not talking about attracting bears or mountain plants to your yard. Mm -hmm. But um, that's really what, what this is all about. And that's why we call it a garden program um, and it's it's pretty simple it's it's a formula and it's based on just basic again wildlife biology 101 all wildlife need habitat and habitat is made up of four things food water cover and a place where they can breed and raise their young and those are the things that you can create right in a garden setting to support wildlife so the food, the water, the cover makes sense. Now, now cover also includes ground cover, right? Because, you know, using mulch, using, uh, you know, kind of shade to keep the, the sun from penetrating and killing the soil is a big deal. Am I, am, right. I, am I right about the cover there? Yeah. So, yeah, when we talk about cover for wildlife, it's really just, it, it's, it, it helps wildlife in a couple of different ways. Number one, wildlife are like us when the weather's bad. They need to you know, get out of it. They want to find cover somewhere. You know, if it's really windy, if it's raining, if it's snowing, if it's hailing, um, you know, imagine a butterfly in a heavy rainstorm, right? They're going to be pummeled, right? So they typically are looking for, you know, uh, dense vegetation where they can hide from, again, those, the, the bad weather or, um, you know, crevices or cracks in, in, you know, tree bark and rocks and things like that. So animals need to need just cover from the elements. They also need cover um, if they're a prey species, from their predators. Um, you know, if you're just sitting out in the open on a lawn, you're kind of a sitting duck. And so mm -hmm. animals are constantly seeking places to hide. And it goes for predators too. You know, predators need places to hide from their prey mm -hmm. so they can get a meal. And and the, the key here, going back to plants, is that in a garden setting, um, really your plants are gonna be the main way that you provide cover for wildlife. And in this case, it's oftentimes a little bit about less about what you plant and more about how you plant it. So what we recommend is that you try to think when you're designing your garden or your landscape to plant densely. You know, don't just plant one tree in the middle of, of a big open lawn. Um, what you might do instead is mimic Mother Nature. And if you do have a big, say, canopy tree, maybe you can underplant that with a smaller understory tree or some shrubs and then underplant those with some smaller shrubs and, and wildflowers. And ultimately what you do, you get this layering effect where there's vertical habitat. Um, you know, if, if you can't do that, maybe, you know, instead of planting just like one bush out in your yard, maybe instead you plant a, a row of them along your property line. And it becomes a living fence, almost like a hedge. And if you pick native plant species, not only will it provide cover and a corridor across that open suburban landscape, but if you pick the right species, those same plants will also provide food in the form of you know, seeds or berries or nectar um, or sap or nuts. I mean, these are all ways that our native plants provide food for wildlife. So it really is, is, is all about your plants, both for cover, also for food. And, and this is really important, especially if you're a bird lover, and most people that get into this get into it because they like seeing colorful songbirds in their backyard. I always joke that that birds are kind of the gateway drug into this world of wildlife. <laughs> um, but here's the thing about, about birds. Again, plants are going to be the best way that you can feed them um, sustainably in the long term. I mean, you can fill a bird feeder, and that's okay to do as a supplement. But most birds only use feeders, again, as a supplement to their natural foods. And a lot of bird species will never visit a bird feeder. So if you really want to sustainably support local and migratory bird populations, it's all about putting those native plants in, again, that provide the seeds and the nuts and the berries and all that. But here's the, the key thing. Those native plants also support insects. Some studies have shown up to 60% more insects than a typical um, landscape that's planted with just a bunch of non-native species. And 96% of our upland terrestrial birds, that's the songbirds that you're trying to attract to your yard, 
absolutely rely on insects and other invertebrates as a critical food source for themselves and at this time of year to feed their babies. So what that boils down to is if you wanna see birds, you need bugs and in order to have bugs, you need native plant communities and not to be spraying pesticides. So that's how you feed wildlife. You plant stuff that's gonna feed them directly, you do it once and then you walk away and you can sip your coffee and watch the animals. You don't have to refill a feeder every day. That's kind of the genius thing about this. So one of the things that, so when we talk about native, you know, I live in Southern California, you know, there's native, you know, California poppies, there's sagebrush, there's things that are, you know, kind of chaparral uh, landscape. Uh, and then we have our vegetable garden. Do you, do you talk about maybe doing like square foot gardening where you kind of mix the different species in with each other so you get some food, you get yeah. some stuff for the bugs, like it's almost like a, an offering to the local birds? <laughs> yeah, so uh, this is a great point. What we're not necessarily advocating is that, you know, you need to go out and completely start from scratch or rip out your entire landscape or, you know, even though it doesn't really help wildlife, um, you know, you don't have to get rid of every square inch of your lawn. But what we try to encourage people to do is, is you know, even if it's in small increments each year is to add more natives, add more habitat features and, you know, start small. I mean, a garden is never really done, right? If you're a gardener, you know that you're constantly tinkering and adding. And so, yeah, you can absolutely, you know, incorporate vegetables or, you know, even, even some non-native plants are fine too, as long as they're not invasive. This is when a non-native plant or other species um, kind of escapes our, our cultivation. It jumps the garden fence, if you will, and, and reproduces like crazy and overtakes the habitat of native species. And unfortunately, a lot of our worst native plants were introduced to the garden trade. Hmm. But even with that said, there are things, you know, like for your region in particular, things like um, like lavender, which is not native here in North America, but it does. It's not invasive and it does have some habitat value. It's a great nectar source for bees. So, yeah, you can incorporate vegetables. You can incorporate some non-invasive exotics as long as you're really trying to add as many native species as you can. And, yeah, it's really, this is all about sharing our little piece of the earth our own yards, our own gardens, our own communities. And it doesn't have to be a wilderness habitat, right? It can be a beautiful, you know, neat and tidy looking garden as long as you're planting the right things and, ha and you know, put some thought into those habitat features, um, like a water feature. That's the second component of habitat. We've talked about food a little bit. We talked about cover. Water is something that all animals need. They either need to drink it or in the case of birds, they need to bathe in it to keep their feathers clean. Um, some species actually live in the water. And so, um, you know, you can put in a garden pond. That's a fabulous way of providing a water resource. But you know what? A bird bath works just fine. You know, different species are going to use water in different ways. So if you want aquatic turtles and wading birds, yeah, you're going to have to have a bigger pond. But if you, um, you know, you're cool with just the songbirds and, and the butterflies and things like that, something like a bird bath is just fine. So um, you really have a lot of options. You know, you, this, this formula of food, water, cover, places to raise young can really be implemented in a million different ways. Mm -hmm. And it's totally conducive to your local regional conditions. So it's kind of neat in that way. You know, what's funny is it's started to spawn advocacy amongst myself and my, my, my kids. And because what we have is, you know, I'm in a neighborhood where I have, you know, a delicious garden. There's all kinds of life coming through. And, and there's just this kind of proclivity towards seeing all these dead bees on the ground. And so I started looking into it and realizing that a lot of the neighbors were buying uh, plants with neonics, right? So these neonicanoids are killing. So the bees are coming over, hanging out, having a great party in my yard, going over to the neighbor's yard and getting poisoned. And so now like we've mobilized the kids in the community to go through and be like, look, this is, you know, we're trying to be habitat friendly here. And then, you know, there's the association and like, you know, all these, like no one knows, no one cares. Right. And so it gets you to come, become a lot more involved when you're seeing everything dying around you. Yeah. And you know, that, that's, you, again, you, you, you're really perceptive and that is, also one of our goals with our Garden for Wildlife program. We know that when people have a personal experience, it's meaningful. And you know, we could preach until we're blue in the face, you know, oh, protect the environment, you know, do this and do that. But if we can help people have a personal experience where they learn in a fun way what wildlife needs to survive, and then they help create that and the wildlife show up, and I guarantee the wildlife will show up if you do this. I always, you know, paraphrase Field of Dreams. If you plant it, they will come. It absolutely works. And when, when you plant, you know, a, 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 a vine that has a red tubular flower and that same day the hummingbirds show up, 
I mean, wow, what an incredible experience. And it really kind of ignites people's passion. And what we have found at the National Wildlife Federation from doing this program for 40 plus years is that it's a really incredible way of, of engaging people and getting them um, a little bit more aware about what wildlife needs to survive, not just on their local level, you know? And so a lot of our folks who create wildlife friendly gardens and participate in this program also are very active in larger wildlife conservation issues. And they absolutely can be a consumer voice for things like the issue of neonicotinoid pesticides, which I don't, I don't know how, how many people know what they are, but essentially they are systemic pesticides that inhabit all parts of a plant and they're really great for the garden industry because they you know they keep the the plant stock from getting you know nibbled on and, and otherwise destroyed by potential pests unfortunately they poison insects and it, it, again it's systemic so it's in the leaves it's in the nectar it's in the pollen and a lot of plants that, that are currently treated with those can actually be bad for wildlife even if it's a native plant that's advertised to plant to attract butterflies or, or birds. So what we what we are really trying to do um, at National Wildlife Federation is exactly what you described: is um, you guys out there in the world who don't want to see your your garden plants treated with neonicotinoids need to go to your garden center, and you need to tell them we want neonicotinoid free plants. You need to call your big box retailers and tell them that you don't want plants treated with that. And there are a lot of nurseries, like my local nursery um, that I go to um, in Maryland, right over the border uh, uh, with DC, is a neonicotinoid free nursery. And they're proud of that and they, they announce it. Um, so as consumers, we can be a really powerful voice. And if, if each of us does that, you better bet that the industry is going to hear and they're going to try to come up with other alternatives uh, or just abandon the use of those neonicotinoids. So yeah, so the, the Garden for Wildlife program is, is so multifaceted. It gives you this great feeling of reward when you see the animals show up, but it really is a, a, sort of a maybe a first step into becoming um, an even deeper conservationist. So it's, it's kind, of, kind of cool that way. I love it. I mean, I was in on the garden with, with the kids and I started doing it and it just, it just started growing into a thing that I just love coming home to now. And, yeah. you know, it's made me passionate about the neonics. It's made me passionate about a lot of things. So uh, I, I'm reading that I can actually get my, uh, my garden certified. What, yes. what, what is that? So the, the certification is basically the National Wildlife Federation's way of saying thank you and recognizing the efforts of everybody out there that cares enough to try to make a little space for the birds and the butterflies and the other wildlife. And um, it's also a way of, of counting this effort. It helps us know that we're having an impact. And, and it honestly does help us, you know, when, when more people participate, it gives us that stronger voice when we do try to advocate for things like getting rid of neonicotinoids and allowing, you know, landscape ordinances that make, uh, you know, make allowances for things like native plants and so on and so forth. So I actually have our certified wildlife habitat yard sign here. So this is something that you can get. Only people that have certified their yard or other garden space can post this. Um, and here's how it works. I mentioned those four components of habitat, food, water, cover, places to raise young. Um, by the way, places to raise young is things like um, nesting boxes for birds, host plants for butterfly caterpillars, you know, a pond where amphibians can breed. The idea there is that it's great if we can feed, you know, one bird that flies through our yard, but if we're really going to help wildlife populations, we have to give them a habitat that will allow them to reproduce and sustain their populations. So it's a really, really important piece of, of what a habitat's all about. But if you provide food, water, cover, places to raise young, and you commit to, you know, maintaining that yard or that garden space, in a natural, sustainable way. So in other words, you know, not spraying pesticides everywhere, um, not attracting all the birds to your yard and then letting your cat go out and eat them all. <laughs> uh, you know, doing things like practicing water conservation. If you do those kinds of things, then you, you're eligible to get certified. And so May is Garden for Wildlife Month. Each year we set aside this entire month to really kind of promote this program and really beat the drum because, you know, what better month to get out into the garden than May, pretty much all over the country. Mm -hmm. And so for the month of May, we're actually doing kind of a special promotion that hopefully will get lots of folks out there excited about participating. So um, what the promotion is all about is, you know, we, there, we do have fees involved because it helps us the money goes right back into our programs and helps us print our materials and run our website and frankly pay our staff. So um, what we're doing is we have an application fee and then for um, these yard signs, there's an additional fee. We're basically reducing that by 20% if you certify during the month of May. 
So if you go to our website, it's nwf.org slash garden, or if you just Google Garden for Wildlife, it'll take you right to our Garden for Wildlife website. First, you can read up on how to do this. We've got a ton of information on there um, on how to provide those four components of habitat, how to maintain it sustainably, and everywhere you'll see the button that says certify. When you're ready, you just click on that button, and it's super simple. It's a checklist. It goes through each of those components, and there's minimum requirements. This is an honor system. It's we're not the yard police. I'm not going to show up in your yard <laughs> with a checklist. Um, you know, again, the idea here is to create a movement. We want to engage everybody out there that's even doing the basic stuff and reward them and giving them, you know, sort of the, the honor, the bragging rights to say that I have a certified wildlife habitat garden with the National Wildlife Federation. How cool is that? And when people do that and they post the yard sign, it is an incredible grassroots way of promoting this idea throughout your communities. And as I travel the country. I can't tell you like how amazing it is when I'm just like walking down the street or driving down the street and I see our certified habitat yard signs. It's it's pretty incredible. And it's a simple way that we each can make a difference. It's really literally the best uh, embodiment of that idea of think globally, but act locally, right? Mm -hmm. You can make wildlife habitat literally right outside your door. It's gonna help local wildlife, it's gonna help migratory wildlife, and it's gonna be a place where you can go outside every day and get that dose of nature that most of us don't get. And so there's just, there's so many cool elements to our Garden for Wildlife program that I really hope lots of people go out and, and get involved and get certified and help us spread the word. I love it, I love it. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go online. I think I gotta fix our pond to qualify for all of it uh, and, and just get it. You know, we've had, we've had trouble with like algae blooming in the, in the pond yeah. because it gets so, so warm here. So we're looking at like getting frogs and, and putting some fish in there or something to, yeah. to eat that. And I've, had, I've yeah. looked at a couple solutions. I'll give, you, I'll give you a tip. My advice with algae is, um, is to plant your pond because the more um, sort of aquatic wetland emergent type plants that you have in and around your pond, mm. what that's gonna do is number one, it's gonna shade the water. And algae typically blooms when it gets a ton of sun, when the water is really warm, and when, and when there's sort of excess nutrients in the water. So if you have other plants in the water, it shades out the algae, it keeps the water cool, and those plants are, will outcompete the algae for the nutrients in the water. Mm -hmm. And so you, if you, you know, you you can pretty much manage your algae population that way. Um, so I would try that, and that might be um, a little bit more natural than getting into. You know, you can get chemicals that will kill the algae and things like that. But uh, yeah, yeah so. so Common problem with ponds. Yeah, yeah, it's a common problem, and so you know we've we've been looking at you know what to do because it's got a, a waterfall kind of feature thing, so it's like a lot of suction. But you know the, these are things that you work out, right? I want my kids right. to to know what tadpoles are right there in their backyard. Yeah, yeah so absolutely. awesome. I'm in. I'm in. I'm doing this. I'll do some Facebook lives from the yard just to kind of track the progress okay. through May. Uh, and do what it takes to kind of get get it to the next level um, and go. I mean, so this this is great. It's grassroots as it gets. It's very folksy and it's very hands on. And so I love these types of initiatives. And, and it works. I mm -hmm. guarantee you. Again, if you go out and plant some native plants, you are gonna see birds. You're gonna see butterflies. You're gonna see bees. You know, pollinators as a class of animals, bees in particular, are declining. And I'm not just talking about honeybees, which are really a domesticated European species. We have 4,000 species of bees that are native to North America. You probably have them in your yard and you don't even know it. Uh, and many of them are declining too. And so, you know, again, the simple act of planting a native wildflower is a powerful conservation act that will help support those animals and give them a habitat that used to be there and then we, we wiped it out. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just such a feel good program. And I'm, I'm, if you can't tell, I'm, it's one of my favorite things that I get to work on. Um, in fact, I, I was doing this stuff before I even came to work at the National Wildlife Federation 17 years ago. Um, I was in college and I you know, made my parents pull up all their landscaping and, you know, uh, but it, you know, it really does work and it really is inspirational and it really does help. I love it. It's because we're, we're in a political climate right now that isn't really pro-wildlife. Uh, and so, you know, these types of grassroots efforts are, are incredibly important, especially now when you know, legislation is starting to move in directions that, that take away some of the protections. Are there any concerns there uh, uh, for the NWF that you, know, you would like my audience to know about? Like, what do we need to watch out for? Where do we need to be meticulous? Well, I think um, you know, the, the, the simplest uh, thing I can give as far as advice goes is what the National Wildlife Federation's position is. And that is, you know, we need to be science-based and we need to obviously make sure that whatever 
uh, policy level decisions are made that it, it, it you know accommodates wildlife. And so you know, for example, for the first time in our entire 81 year history, the National Wildlife Federation opposed a presidential cabinet appointee in Scott Pruitt for the administrator of the EPA because he has a record of ignoring science, and that is not something that. Um, that we can tolerate and somebody responsible for the health of, of, of our environment that we all rely on, people and wildlife alike. Unfortunately, we didn't win that battle. But um, I would say follow the National Wildlife Federation, not just our Garden for Wildlife program, but um, visit our website. Again, it's nwf.org. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. Um, we have a whole branch called Wildlife Action. Um, where if you are a little bit more policy oriented and, you know, kind of identify more as an activist, we are always um, putting out action alerts and ways that you can get involved on the legislative level to really let your voice as an American who cares about wildlife heard. Um, and so we definitely need as many people as possible to do that on, you know, everything from climate change to clean energy to, you know, protecting um, our national monuments and parks that, you know, could be under threat. Um, so I would definitely recommend that as well. Um, so you can and you can do both. You know, you can do the fun, feel good stuff. You can get your kid a subscription to Ranger Rick magazine. You can create a wildlife habitat garden and you can also, you know, come to D.C. and march with us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, whatever you can, but do something. Moral right. of the story is do something, get involved. Uh, wow, I, I'm inspired. I'm going to get my garden uh, hooked up uh, this next week or so, just get my pond sorted out, and I think I'm, I think I'm ready, and then I'm going to start some advocacy in my neighborhood. Um, I love it. You know, it's, it's, just, it's just part of you know, being a good citizen. Is, is, well, hey, know. listen, I, I would love it if you came onto our um, Garden for Wildlife Facebook group and shared photos of what you've done in your yard and as you um you know as you continue down the path of being a wildlife gardener we love hearing those um, those stories from the participants and um, we're garden for wildlife on facebook um, on twitter we're garden the number four wildlife and um, again we love seeing photos of the wildlife and the plants and asking and, you know answering questions I'm, one, I'm the admin on both of those social media pages. So um, it's a great way to connect directly with me. If you are, you know, if anybody listening out there or watching um, wants, you know, has any questions, please do. Um, we love interacting with people that way. And we're doing one more special promotion this month only for Garden for Wildlife Month. And that is if you sign up for our newsletter, we're gonna enter you in for a chance to win what we're calling a Habitat Helper Kit. And what's included in that is a, uh, a nesting box for a wren, um, a bird bath, a butterfly house, a bird feeder, and a, and a signed copy of my book, which is called Attracting Birds, Butterflies, and Other Backyard Wildlife. If you sign up for our newsletter this month in May at nwf.org slash garden, um, then you'll get entered in to win this whole Habitat Helper Kit. So hopefully people will do that as well. And honestly, when you, when you sign up for the newsletter or you join the community on social media, it just allows us to share more great information with you. That's what we're really trying to do is just spread you know, our expertise and our knowledge about restoring habitat for wildlife through a garden and get more people involved. I love it. I love it. David, you're a hero. Uh, I appreciate all the work that you're doing uh, and keep up the good work. And you'll see me on the Facebook page. I'll, I'll, I'll start snapping some shots and get in there and get involved. And you know what? Uh, to my audience, my fans out there, let's get going. Uh, let me see what you're doing. Let's start gardening together. It's the perfect time of year anyways. Let's start sharing best practices and looking at what we can do to be kind of bastions of, of health and stability within our communities and let it grow out from there. I love, I love the orientation of growing from grassroots out and uh, it doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing advocacy work, but I mean, you know, do what you got to do at your, at your home. So, David, thank you so much. Give us the websites one more time. Yep, it's NWF as a National Wildlife Federation, nwf.org slash garden. That'll take you right to our Garden for Wildlife homepage. Love it, love it. Let me know what you think. Uh, let me know what you're going to do with your garden. Join the group and let us know within our uh, Urban Monk Academy group what you're doing. Let's do this together. I will see you next time. Thank you.